everybody. So, it has been said we do an awful lot on generation, and that's actually very true because I find it a fascinating subject, but we don't do much on what to do with it when it comes out here. There's a reason for that, because what you do with it actually is it's pretty much the same thing. But these things, is this enormous variety of things to look at. I mean, just in terms of the coils and the magnet arrangement, also in terms of how you build it, how you deal with the flux. And when you think about it, you've got to get it to turn. So how do you turn it? You can use wind, water, wave, pedal, crank, stick a sterling on it. There's just a ton of ways of getting that to turn, which are equally of great interest. So this bit is hugely interesting. This bit doesn't have that much to it. And so I tend not to concentrate on that because I think the information's there and I think it's easy to do and that's my bad. So I'm really sorry about that. And I thought I would look at what to do with it when it comes out here. To generate the turns, it is universally AC. When those coils are spinning in those magnets, they're an AC current. We need to do something with it to make it to DC because mostly we use DC. Now some mo um, motors, they have a commutator in there and that will rectify it for you. It's called mechanical rectification. Rectification is changing that AC waveform into the DC straight line. Actually, it's kind of like a ripple, but more or less the DC straight line. That's what rectification is. Now a commutator will do that. It's not actual DC, it's pseudo DC. It's quite a bit of ripple in it, but it will do it for you. An AC one, you get AC out. So when you get this, what's coming out of there is either a really poor quality DC or AC. Now, normally we want to do things like, oh, charge a battery bank or run a DC piece of equipment or something like that. So what you do with it, almost straight away, is you rectify it. You rectify it by sticking a diode in there. If it's single phase, like this one, then you're going to use four diodes in an arrangement called a rectifier. If it's three phases, then you use six diodes in an arrangement, and that's called a three phase rectifier. And you get a single phase DC out of it once you've done that rectification. So the very first thing you do with that is you rectify it. If you're getting DC out and you don't care about the ripple, don't bother. But you rectify it so you're getting DC out because mostly we want to use DC. Oddly enough, even if you want to use AC, the chances are you'll rectify it and then invert it, which is the opposite of rectification, into AC to use it. Because this, when it's been spun by the wind, the voltage here is absolutely all over the place. It just goes all over. And that's only because wind, obviously, or whatever you're using, is non-regular, and so this turns at an irregular speed, and so the voltage coming out is very irregular, and none of the equipment that we like will um, take irregular voltages like that. So what you want to do then with it is regulate the voltage. So the first thing, rectify it. Second thing, regulate the voltage. When thinking about it, I thought I'd slip it in there so to speak. What people often do is smooth, because if you don't like that ripple, you can smooth it out and you do that by sticking a capacitor in there. Now, a voltage regulator can be electronic and as simple as a diode and a resistor in series, or it can be electromechanical using a solenoid and a capacitor for the output. Whatever it is, voltage regulation it does what it says on the tin. It keeps the voltage at a fixed level, you know, within bounds, but it keeps it at a fixed level and it can either do it electronically or mechanically. Once you stick a battery on this, you've got a whole new ballpark that you've just entered, because remember, Motors and generators are the same thing. So if you stick this up in the air with a wind turbine on it and connect that straight to a battery, the wind is blowing, sure enough, it will start to charge the battery. The problem arises when the wind stops blowing, it'll pass the current straight back to it and it'll suddenly act like a motor. So your neighbor's flag will be hanging limply and your twin turbine will be mysteriously going like crazy in the reverse direction. So you just can't connect these up straight to a battery. You need to put them through something. And of course, what you put them through is a charge controller. 
charge controllers can be got from Amazon for something like, I don't know, 11 pounds to hundreds of pounds. The price depends, and it depends on what this is going to produce. If you're not producing many amps that are not a very high voltage in its maximum production, then your charge controller is going to be made out of cheap electronics that can handle that, and you're going to pay 11 quid for it. If you're producing kilowatts from this, then you need some heavy-duty electronics, and of course that heavy-duty electronics comes with a price tag, but you need a charge controller. I like the phrase charge controller because it seems to say something. It seems it must be mysterious and complicated, but actually it isn't. I mean, it's really quite simple stuff. It does exactly what we've just discussed, and one extra thing. All it is, is when your battery's full, turn it off. When this is going too quickly and there's too much coming out and you don't want to damage your batteries, well, turn it off. When your battery drops below a certain level, turn it on. <laughs> when this is producing something, turn it on. So a charge controller is very little more than a couple of sensors and some switches. When I say sensors, what you're sensing is voltage level. Now, of course, voltage level can be done electronically or it can be done mechanically. If you have a solenoid and the solenoid is at 12 volts, that's when you're putting enough power to activate the magnet to pull against a spring and that spring can operate a switch. So it really is, in essence, super easy. That's what a charge controller does. All it does is if this starts to produce something, it turns on. If it produces too much, it turns off. Actually, with wind turbines, it uh, directs into what's something called a dump load. It's usually uh, a resistor, like a heating element, or some light bulbs, or something like that. But, too much, turn it off. Sometimes, they turn it into a resistor so that it can act as a brake. When it's charging the battery, which is your other side of it, of course, if your battery's not charged, you want it to charge, so turn it on. If the battery is charged, you don't want to overcharge it, so turn it off. That's actually all they do. Now, of course, switches are what computers are good at. Computers are brilliant at switching things. They're brilliant at taking some sense input, like a level of voltage, and acting on that by turning off or on a switch, and they do it very quickly. But they do it quickly, and they can be programmed to do it, and so it can get stunningly complicated. And there are two main methods of recognising, or rather acting, on that turn it off, turn it on regime. One called PWM, which is pulse width modulation, and the other MPPT, which is maximum power point tracking. Maximum power point tracking is a um, function of your charge controller, not a function of your solar cell or wind turbine. It's really to do with how it turns it off and on. Now, PWM has been with us for decades and you can implement it with little more than a timing circuit and a bit of silicon so like an IGBT or a transistor rated at the power timing circuit is uh, exactly what it says it can be something like a 555 maybe or a clock with a button on it but that's pretty much all there is to PWM and so of course it's a very cheap option. MPPT aims at following the point in the graph of the battery discharge that's called the maximum power point and it does that by sensing voltage and current. Of course there's an awful mo lot more logic and design involved in that and a lot more electronics and so it tends to be very much more expensive. Now the big claim is that MPPT is much more efficient than PWM and yeah maybe it is but I always match efficiency against with how much I'm paying for it it's like you like efficiency per dollar because if you're getting half a percent but it costs you a thousand dollars well you can keep it but you need to look at the price of this thing and whether you're getting what you're paying for as to whether PWM or MPPT is going to be what you're looking for now you'll get an awful lot of gurus who tell you MPPT all the way, otherwise you're wasting your money. It depends how much you're paying and what efficiency advantage you're actually getting for implementing MPPT as to whether it's worth it or not, so don't just do away with PWM. Or get too carried away with the differences between PWM and MPPT. Both of them do exactly the same thing. PWM follows the voltage of the battery on the voltage curve and MPPT follows the power point of the battery on the battery curve but they both do exactly the same thing that is switching things off and on it's just the logic of when they switch differs 
A PWM is something that you can make yourself, actually, from a few components. MPPT is, uh, well, you need a bit of programming there, so chances are you're not going to do it. But a charge controller can be bought as a box online. And if you look at the back of the box, there'll be a red and a black screw terminal, which is where they go. And on the front of the box, there'll be another screw terminal, which is where your batteries go. So it's a bit like plugging in a kettle if you buy one. The only one thing you need to uh, decide on with it really is what's the power output of this? What's the power of your battery bank? What kind of overcharge, over over-discharge lightning protection comes with the little box that you think is going to be of interest to you? But the installation of it consists of screwing these wires into the back of the box and your battery wires into the front of the box. There'll be another set that go to your inverter. That's it. That's all there is to what to do with this once it, the electricity comes out of here, which is exactly why I actually don't do that much on it. But I thought I would cover those ideas. I hope it was of interest. Thank you very much for watching and please do remember to like, subscribe and click the bell notifications.